Welcome to Under Construction with Chadwick's. I'm Donico Callahan, and later we're going to be hearing from Richard in Sunnis in our supplier's corner. But today we are balancing the books on the podcast. Previously, we have heard from hurlers, fantastic rugby players and amazing GA players. But today we're talking about one of our most popular sports with a 20% increase in the attendees at the League of Ireland. Soccer is flying. And to help us celebrate our domestic game, we are delighted to have two of the greats in the country. Bohemians captain Keith Buckley, you're more than welcome. How are you getting on? Good, not bad. You're injured at the moment, Keith. I am, yeah. Yeah, sorry to hear that, but the league is going really well. We're going to get into it in a little bit, but good to see you're uh, yeah. upbeat and looking forward uh, to it. Yeah, I always upbeat already. Yeah, exactly. Oh. It. We also are joined by an uh, Irish icon of soccer, culture and general crack, the brilliant Roddy Collins. Roddy, how are you? Cheers, Donnie. That's brilliant. That's the best introduction <laughs> I've ever heard. I, I do. I, I do. leave that envelope on the counter on the way out. I, I believe it. Absolute <laughs> icon when it comes to it. How are you getting on? Living the dream, Donegal. Are you? Yeah, I'm having the crack, living the dream, uh, dedicating my life. I'm in the last quarter of the game to staying as healthy and as happy as possible, tormenting as many people as possible, driving everyone mad. Yeah, especially my kids and my grandkids. No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, yeah. All good. We, happy out, as they say. We saw you on the Tommy Tierney show and we may chat back a little bit about that. It gave yep. us a great overall uh, stuff. But Roddy, I must say to you, for me, just from characters in sport is what you look for and you have it in spades it's always great to be around you and listen to you um, massively obviously uh, you know fortunate to uh, we used to follow the Rod Squad in the Irish oh, Rugby geez, we, we, stop, will you? we loved it Rod oh, no, we didn't, loved I it didn't. I was mortified actually. were you? Oh, well, I, well I watched it once <laughs> in little bits but some of the stuff on it was horrendous but look it was. Where I, I, you see, I wasn't coming home. When I went to Car- Carlisle, I was going straight to Old Trafford to replace Alex Ferguson that, in my mind. Yeah. So when I was asked to do that, I got a few quid, by the way. I was asked to do it and uh, I'd done it. But, oh, jeez, some of it was embarrassing. But look, it is what it is. I can't undo it now, you know. Yeah. We just got to crack out. That's the main thing. Yeah, dead right. Yeah. Keith, we touched on it there. 20% increase in attendees in the League of Ireland. Soccer's flying in the country, isn't it? It must be... Brilliant for you to play in such a vibrant game, but also it's, you know, um, putting bread on the table. It's brilliant that you can do it at home. Yeah, like you said, bread on the table. Before this, I was a parent decorator and lucky enough to have a three-year contract to be able to play full-time football. But yeah. I think it's since the COVID, as you say, like that, the increase has been brilliant. Yeah. You know, and it's local football and it's a great credit to both clubs and things. Pats, now shells even. Balls have done great in working in the community. But I think you can see that in dividends now are paying in just... I think there's pats and balls and ice shells and rovers. There's a market there and I think we all need to get behind it. Um, from every like every sort of the Irish football community. Like, If you had volunteers from every certain club and put them together and say, listen, can we push this on? You'll have thousands. But, you know, we're banging on the same drum since Roddy's playing about certain things and facilities need improving, you know, but yeah. we need to keep pushing that though. But it, yeah. for people to see you, for young fellas, young boys and girls to see you in the area, you know what I mean? Be getting bread and milk where you're shopping, stuff like that. That's important. That's where it grows. That is the difference. Like, you know, you're probably on a different level than I was. Um, they probably never come across you, you know, and bringing lads over to say Liverpool and stuff. You don't see this. Yeah. And the likes of ourselves, whether we like to know or not, we play a big role in these kids, you know. I got a kid up there a couple of weeks back into the dressing room and his, his mom was saying he hasn't stopped telling everybody about it. And like, Sometimes we don't really run in the bubble. You don't yeah. see that effect you have of them. But now I'm have a board's eye view, I'm injured, I'm seeing a bit different where I'm always just focused on playing. Now I'm seeing that other side of it and it's great, you know. And like one of them kids like me, years ago, um, I used to go to the Shelburne games and look up to own Harry's and stuff and eventually playing with them, you know. And yeah. one of them kids probably tell me in 10, 20 years, you know, hopefully yeah. I manage them and say, look, I remember you, you brought me in and done this, you know. Yeah, yeah. Roddy, it is exciting to see the league getting the recognition it deserves because it has been fantastic for so long, but it's really important we it, keep it that going. It is, Donica, but we have to grasp the nettle, you know. It's not, it's not, I've seen it come and gone 40 years in League of Ireland and I've seen it never as good as this. However, you know, the, the wave can come. We need, we need to, we need to, um, Cash in on it. Yeah, we need to. We need. We need government to get involved. Like we're, we all know about the the Casement Park, and we all know about you know Crow Park investments in GAA. You know, we need people within the FBI to lobby the government stronger, and they're not doing it. If people will go to a game of football, 
for a game of football or the night out. But if the facilities, you get the winter's night and you're in, you're in the back of Talca Park and you're soaked and you have to travel back to Derry, it's, it's a deterrent. So they need to get the facility sorted out. That's the most important. Is that the biggest issue? Yeah. One, come here. I, I, I played at 18, my debut in League of Ireland football. And I was just telling Keith and I, I went back to the ground that I played in about five years ago as a manager. Every single deficiency that was in that club in the dressing rooms was still there. Yeah, and yeah. this was a, a very, uh, I would say, a highly populated area that wants to progress. You know, but look, come on. We have five grounds they said the TV companies will go to. They, uh, that were just capable of actually putting on an, an event for that. Well, for the visibility, for, you know, the yeah, optics of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you go to a game, or you watch, I watch a game on the telly, and I look and I see a, a derelict sight behind the goal. Yeah, okay. Come here, it's like boxing, right? You go to a main event. Sky doesn't sell out a main event. You pay 20 quid for a ticket. Your ringside before them boxers come in. They darken the lights behind, bring everyone down because it's something to be enjoyed, you know, for a viewer. Yeah. But League of Ireland football, if you're not a connoisseur of football, which 90% of the people watching the game don't know about tactics, do you want to see something exciting and listen to the crowd? It's not happening. And for me, if we don't look at Rovers, and every, I think there should be a criteria where every club and in so many years have to have that, whether it's council backed or whether it's benefactors coming in. They shouldn't be allowed playing the league unless they have that or seem to be trying to achieve that because it's, I've seen it come and seen it go and everyone gives it lip service, right? But I'd be worried, to be quite honest with yeah. you. you know? we, we, we'll get to it and let's uh, rip into it. But uh, Keith, I'll go to you. From a player's point of view, the facilities for you to be professional, what are they like? You know, Roddy's chatting about the stadiums and yeah. not being able... How is it from your end? I'm playing the league now, 11, 12 years and probably the same. Dressing rooms are the same. I won't say a certain club, but we're only talking about... <laughs> the dressing rooms are the same. And he's only talking about certain urinals in some dressing rooms are just part partition from the showers. So, like... It's okay, the noise on the outside, but people do forget on the inside as well. The facilities for players, it has to be improving. Like, as much as uh, I'm a Bowes man, as you said, like, Robes have the standard in terms of facilities. You know, when people walk onto the pitch, like, there's a four, st four stands there now. Yeah. The pitch is immaculate. The facilities are brilliant. And you can bring a family there and not be too worried, as you say, during the winter night to be soaked. Hmm. But they're getting it right on both fronts, lads, to be fair, aren't they, facility-wise? I, I know it's tough to yeah, say, no, and I, no. believe me, but uh, like four in a, a row yeah. as well, it does show that if you're joined up off the pitch and on the pitch, you can have success. No, 100%, and we're, and we're going to chase them back, you know, and it's up to everyone else. Uh, they set the standards on and off the pitch, as you say, you know, they've had they've seen a long-term plan, um, Dublin, I think it's South Dublin County Council that own the stadium and they put a plan in place and that's it, you know, and... Mm. Look, they might have certain investors, they say, but again, you can put so much money into certain clubs, you still have to produce on the pitch at the same time, you know? But, but sorry, Donna, you, no. you, you said something at the very opening about if you've got all the volunteers, that's the problem. Volunteers aren't going to progress. You need an industry where people are held, held accountable for what they've to achieve within the club. You know, a volunteer can go, oh, well, I don't be best. I'm doing it for nothing. I'm a volunteer. We need a, a, an industry where everybody involved in the club is on a wage. And this is what I'm saying, lobby the government, because the government are looking at League of Orna Fall, well, maybe 30,000 uh, people attending games, not much votes in that one, you know. We give them money, look what they've done over the years, they've washed it down to Swanee. So we need industry where, say, okay, if this industry employs 10,000 people, or just for if, off, the, off the figure, what are we going to get back on PRC? What are we going to get back into our corporates, you know? And then we'll have people that can get involved and then they'll spend the money. That's what we need. Like, yeah. All this time, honestly, Donegan, I've heard all this before. I know that. I know that. But if you look, and I know it's a totally different league, but if you look at what Man City have done, they've done what you're on about, really professional, but they've also done a brilliant job of looking after the volunteers and empowering them into the community so that you bring on the games from all around. So it, it, it's a bit of a bit of Yeah, both, but that's politics. It? That's what they're to wash with. That's not a necessity. That's politics. Yeah, League okay. of Ireland volunteers are a necessity. Yeah. I remember when I was manager of balls and there was an officer for the pitch, there was an officer for this, there was an officer for that. It was an absolute joke. And that was there to sit around the table. That was their involvement. And they wore the badge. Well, I'm in, I'm in charge of this. That's wrong. Yeah. You know what I mean? It should be what's best for the lads on the pitch. And forget it. Like, okay, Bowes are probably more um, famous now for their off-field involvement in 
you know, different political situations or, or you know, community uh, uh, programmes or whatever. My, show me the trophy cabinet up there. I, I, I could throw a stone in my back garden at the, the Daily Mount. That's what it's about. And then when you progress there, the rest comes and underpins it. So then if you go into Europe, you can give more money to donations to everyone, but, you know... I challenge on it a little bit because that's the top end of it. You don't have to be successful as a team to, and I know we we look at trophies. It's all about trophies, but being right for the community. You know what I mean? Like keep young boys and girls seeing you out there, having aspirations, being a place to go where everyone can meet up, where you feel this is an anchor. You know what I mean? You might say what you want about religion, but it seems to be where Irish people are going now with yeah, sport. But, but Donegan, do you not, you, and you know, because you've won enough, do you not think they want to be in your uh, company more if you're a winner? Do you not think, like, if you, if you want a trophy at Bowes, you might meet 50 kids every week. You want a trophy, you'll see 5,000 kids coming down. You know, it's all about success and how you gauge success and how to gauge success in League of Ireland has been um, so not, not insolvent at the end of the season, basically, or not, you know, uh, bankrupt or not having to pull players' wages. That's That was the yardstick on League of Ireland football in a lot of my time, a lot of my clubs. I worked for clubs that went bankrupt. Mm. I didn't bankrupt them. Mm. You know, because the whole, the whole business plan and people w- w- talk about Rovers, look at the background. Ray Wilson, very successful businessman in Australia. Uh, Desmond another one so they can marry it's a success with the financial and they can be um, sustainable and successful and that's what we need to strive for I'm going back to my sport and I just look at Monster. So the, the, like everything, money has changed the games and it really has pushed on if you haven't got deep pockets. So Monster, like I hope they win the European Cup every year, but they mightn't. Yeah. But you would measure success in different ways. It, like bringing young, homegrown boys and girls through, that is success as well, isn't it, Keith? You know, yeah, being it right is relative for the area. to the club at the time as... As you said, like, well, 15 years since, I think 16 years since uh, Bo was doing one of them in 2008. And just started talking about the push, what it is now. You'd be lucky to get 2,500 through the gate when you're winning stuff then. Yeah. And now we're getting, we haven't won that in 15 years, we're 4,000. But imagine then, like, there's queues out the door to get the daily. We did there last yeah. week. Imagine then if you win a couple of trophies on top of that. What, expand it again? Agreed. You know? Yeah, but well, Keith, when I took over Bowes, the average gate was 800 people. 33 months later, the average gate was 4,000. People want to be involved in success. Yeah. No, but There's no doubt in that. But to Keith's point as well, they want to be around people that share the same values and they want to look on the pitch at a team that reflects where they're from and what they're about and be proud of that. And we know sport as well. I, 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 this is my own personal opinion. You don't need to win every time to show that. Of course, we all want to be competitive, but sometimes it, it's enough to be good I people of the team. I think it's easier for us as we get older to see that. But as when I'm a young lad, Brown the Bollywood yeah. to do is win. win. You know, and yourself. But yeah. as you get older, you see different types of snares. But well, my job is to win trophies at the club, and I haven't done that in 15 years. Yeah. Could, yeah, yeah. could I ask then, is, is what Rovers have done on the pitch good for the league, or is it, is it, you know, is it bad? Brilliant. Brilliant. And I hope to win another four in a row, and I'll get slaughtered by balls, but I don't care because they're doing it right. Mm. They're the model club. So you don't bring them down as we do in Ireland. Oh, bring them down. It's not. It's brilliant. We try and go to where they are. And then they try to step up to another level in European competition. Qualify for knockout stages every year. That brings the whole thing forward. And then what happens is, Keith won't leave the country to play somewhere else. Other kids won't leave to go to League 2 or League 1 or the Championship. And then you'll have Championship players want to come play here. You have to grow the whole thing. You know what I mean, Donegal? Like back, back, in, back in the day, right back then, probably before your time, there'd be 300 watching Leinster. Yeah. There'd be 300. So, they, 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 they're all indigenous players, really. Yeah. So, the I, ones I coming to New Zealand, oh, did they help it? Did they yeah, make it more sexy? Well, that's the same with soccer. Yeah. I went to my brother, he played in an Interpro, Munster versus Leinster in Dourad Oil. So, it was in one of the club grounds. And I'd say if there was 300 people, there was a lot. And not yeah. only that, I'd say you could say 80% of them were family. Yeah. And now yeah. it's filling out the Aviva. Yeah. And you're right, it is because, the, I, I credit the RFU, they got the model right. But what about our own even, let's just chat about Damien Duff, having someone like him back in shells, you know what I mean? That type of calibre of, of of player and coach in the league, it must be a good thing if we're chatting about... Like, he's a character, you have to yeah. give him that. And, you know, you have to understand, like, he's over 100 caps for Ireland. Yeah. And he doesn't come in and, 
look, speaking to Lazarus, you speak of him that he doesn't think he's above anybody else, which is good, you know. And he, you just listen to people talk about him. I have a friend that played there saying that when he went to, I think it was Rovers 15, so professional, he told him, we need to train more. So it's half six in the morning for training under 15 years of age. And he'd have parents saying, he said, well, if they want to get better, the contact time with the ball needs to be more because they're probably training two and a half hours a week. And now that could be running. So yeah. if you want to get more contact time with the ball, you need to put the effort in. I lived away in um, Australia for a year. You should see the uh, the willing to learn and the, and the train over there. Yeah. I'd be doing some one on one sessions at six thirty in the morning. Yeah, they go to school on their school, and they ha- if they're involved in soccer over there, they do a little bit of practice there, and then yeah. they training the team three nights a week. Yeah, yeah. And they want to get better, and if you want to get better, you have to put the time in. Do. Of course you do. But talking about Damien, Damien's in a privileged position. He's brilliant. I, I think he's fantastic. I went down to watch his first ever pre-season game with Shells just to see how he'd react and how... He, and there was a, an assessor there um, with a, one of those folders, you know, a referee's assessor. Yeah. And he's looking and he's gone and he come over beside me. How are you, Rod? I said, how are you? What's the crack? I'm just assessing. We want to have a look at Damien's conduct just before the season starts. And I said, right, okay, stuff. It was <laughs> a friendly, it was a friendly <laughs> three <laughs> weeks later he was doing summer salad. He was bashing everyone. <laughs> but he's in a privileged position because Damien is financially sorted. There's no problem with that. And, and best of luck to him. And he's a great, he'll always be an icon in my book, right? We've managers who can't pay the mortgage, right? That would just say, yes or no, sir, right? And that's what's holding the league back as well. You need to bang that table and go into a chairman and say, we can win this league, but I need Donaghy, I need Bucco, and I need someone else. And I want them. And if I don't get them, I'm walking out of here. And that's how you're successful in this. Because if you just saunter along, I, I, and I'll kick on back to me, but I have to say it because it's relevant. I was managing Bowers. Oh, it was a disaster in the boardroom. I had my own plastic company. I, I no problem with money. So I went in there to win. And I promised him I'd win the league. And when I went then I knew how to win the league because I won it as a player. I knew what we needed. I, cr- I got paid for my own company for players. I got fellas to sponsor buying players. Trevor Malloy was bought by a, 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 roof, a road a contractor. And all against the wishes of the board. Right? And we won the double in 33 months. They hadn't won a double in 75 years, 76 years. A double in 33 months. A league, the first in 27 years, and the first cup in 11 years. And we done that in 33 months because I was banging the table. I got sacked the minute we won it, but I can understand that. But that's what we need in the league. We've too many yes men hiding. Oh, well, they would blame the lads. I blame this, I blame that because we need to pay me mortgage. And that's what's going on, Keith. Yeah, uh, but I'm not. to name them. No, no, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Fill your boots, fella. Fill your boots. But Roddy, just on that, it, that's a corporate side. It, it's like every business. You mentioned it there. So leave leave the soccer people look after the soccer, but leave commercial aware, commercially aware people look after looking after players and player welfare and also the other sides of it. That's right. important. I'm going to ask. I, I, I don't know, but I would love to put it out there. How many clubs in Ireland have a full-time professional uh, commercial manager. I'd love to know. Yeah. I'd love to know. Because I worked with clubs, had nothing. You couldn't get them on the phone. But surely something is changing because people are voting with their feet. People are going. 20% increase. You know, I know we're going back to it, but people want to be there. And if They want to be out of the house. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, yeah. seriously, like Keith said it, lockdown. Why are people going? Why are they going? Is there an element of the cost in it? Like, the cost of living there was becoming usually we're yeah. trying to bring two, three kids across and to see Man United Liverpool now. A couple of hundred, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, True. It is. You go down the road, local football, loyal football, and you're going to get it for 60 quid for a family. Yeah. And it's lively. Yeah. You're going to see and a great game. That's what we game. have to push. Right. Yeah. Can we chat about Daily Mount? Your own personal opinions on, because you mentioned it there, there it's buzzing. You like how the redevelopment and, and all that. What's your own personal feelings on that? Are you excited about it? Yeah, I am. <clears throat> Hopefully I'm still there for the yeah. time... Uh, Comes around and get myself a testimonial. <laughs> <laughs> Dead right. <laughs> no, but... We'll uh, do the commercial thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but as we're only speaking this again, like, I hope they keep an element of of what it is now. Yeah. And it's not just this kind of a flashy new stadium. You know, you have, you've got the place, the, the new the new uh, members coming in and the members are there 40, 50 years. Yeah. Like Roddy would have seen it back in the time. So, what's some more than games? 44,000 is, is, is the record, I think, wow. that, that yeah, we can get there for the international yeah. games. Yeah. But they remember daily from them there. So there has to be some kind of element that you keep within. When it's redeveloped, that's not, as I say, 
brand new flashy modern stadium. Th- that's hard though. How do you keep that? You know what I mean? Because that's a point of difference. Like it is, you know, it's so important. That's the biggest thing that's holding that club back. Nostalgia. And down in Tolka when there's protests, keep Tolka Park, build one stadium between the two of them, keep what you can, memories or the pitch or whatever, but saying keeping the older members happy. The older members held the club back at my time. They held it back. I got a sponsor to come in and we wanted to create a bar for sponsors. Put Dunnigan and his company over there, book them over there, and they pay four grand a year, they pay, and bring their friends to a game. And I had this all sorted up a member robe uniform. And I said, and he said, and how are the members going to get to the stand? I said, go around the long way. Oh no, that's not happening. That probably knocked back a hundred grand in my day, which would have been probably a third of the budget. The members don't enjoy it. We won the league and we won the cup and we had a big marquee raking in the money. Right? And uh, a certain man came out and he said, this would be a great club without that fucking football. That's what he said. Mm. They've done all the clubs. There's people drinking that bar and never seen the pitch. But it, it is iconic. It, like talking about, we, we can't lose bits of like that. It, like I, we had that as well. You mentioned Holman Park. But when we redeveloped that, it was really important to us that we didn't lose. It, like something happens in Toman when we play. It's very hard to describe, but there's a tie between the crowd and the pitch. You represent them where you're from, exactly what you're saying. It's a special place to play in. Yeah. But one of the things we thought of as players that w- was important to us is that we kept playing there. So we, we, we redevelop it, but we we still tog out there. And like there was times that pitch wasn't probably fit for purpose, yeah. but we were still on it to make yeah. sure we didn't have a separation so that no one, it, there wasn't this big unveiling. Because I played in other rugby grounds where they've, and they've taken the heart and soul out of the place. That can happen. But going back to Milltown, Milltown was as iconic on the south side as Daily Mount. I'll come back to Daily Mount. I could throw a stone in my back garden at the Daily Mount when I was a kid. Milltown was iconic. They'd throw it back. What? <laughs> They'd throw it back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, they keep it. They keep it. come back. M- M- Milltown was iconic. But look, it moved on under controversial circumstances and we had all this cram and we had everything. But you ask the people, there's 10,000, 8,000 people going to Tallinn now. They never heard of Milltown, most of them. You have to march on, right? Now you can say it was relocated and it's a different population. Daily Mount and Fisborough and Stony Batter, I was rare in them areas. I would say, 80% of the people down there aren't indigenous from that area. They're all people coming in from... Nowadays, yeah? Yeah. yeah. But that's why that's important too, though, because there's the focal point. There's where you go to bring us all together. Go, you know what I mean? Heading well, to well do you know Mount. what, Don, Don, you hit the nail on the head because when I go to Daily Mount, which is not that often in the last couple of years, it's like a hipster's reunion down there now. Right? There's a hardcore of football supporters who back the team and all that and they're sort of being dismissed into the corner. It's all about the, the hipsters from Stony Bat. No. If you have a, a season ticket... But it's, Roddy, it's, it's, like, be honest, that's what they're saying about the Aviva Stadium during the rugby at the moment. Like, it's, you know what... Roy Keane slagged Old Trafford for it at a time. You, you, you can't have both sides of it. So you can't, you can't expect the money to come into the game without, you know what I mean, having the supporters there that are paying for it. Because some people are playing for the soccer and watching it, but others are paying for a family day out and an experience. Yeah, but you're not going to get that in Daily Mount. If, if, and I understand where Keith's come from. He's actually a compromised discussing it, really, because if he says something about you, go in tonight, you go, ah, here, Keith, give it over. Yeah. I, I wish it could be daily uh, renovated 20 years ago when I was there as the manager and brilliant and go down and look at and that. You know what I mean? But whatever comes up is better than what it is now. Yeah. And my history's in my mind and my memories are in my mind of daily. You know, when yeah. I was a kid bunking in. <laughs> Happy days, everyone's jumped the wall, no, haven't got, they? No, we got a lift over, it was called. <laughs> okay, and then okay. I remember as a kid going down with the lads and getting on the pitch when the pitch was four foot off the terraces. Right, and there was a big fence around it when it was international days, and there was a dog called Sasha, a big Afghan hound, and Paddy <laughs> Dunn, the groundsman owner. We'd bunk in, have a game on the pitch, right? And then you'd go to get out, and Sasha would be there. And you'd run across the pitch, and he'd be around there. Yeah. So we had to walk around, who's going to sacrifice who? And then we'd all go, there'd be <laughs> one left. <laughs> there we go. But oh, Keith, never the one left. Yeah, you? exactly. You always <laughs> run fast enough. But just on it, the, the redevelopment, how would you be about it? How do you think the supporters would be about it in terms of trying to keep that uniqueness? I think they, 
they would all agree. He, what he says, hipsters, they say, oh, like coming down, the people at the end of the day coming to the turnstiles. Yeah. And that's all that matters, you know? Mm -hmm. And again, I don't know what way it's going to be. I don't get involved in anything to do with all the field stuff. That's not my job. Um, but me personally, I'd love to see the floodlights somewhat kept there because that is iconic, you know? And you see yeah, them from yeah. miles away. You can build stuff around it as well, you know? And I think, you know, heading to the floodlights, you can see them from miles away. I can see them from down here sometimes. And then, as Roddy says, down Cabra, you see them from all different sides and you follow the floodlights. But is it used in that, like, it's been used in the past, wasn't it? Tin Lizzie, Bob Marley, yeah. I, I to actually use it. Like, the, the French are quite good at doing that. Putting a, a, a pitch somewhere and everyone using it. Maybe a GA club using yeah. it, maybe a concert using it. It's fit for purpose for all. Barry McGuigan made his professional debut on Daily Mount. No way. On the Charlie Nash European yeah. defence. So it was at it. We died. I remember he was a kid. He made it. I was at the Tin Lizzie and the Bob Marley concerts. This is my thing when I speak to uh, prospective investors in football clubs and they Rod, what do you think? I say, when you buy a football club, it has to be working 24 7. It can't be just a football yeah, club twice yeah. a week. Yeah. You've got to utilize what you've got. You look at the space you have, that's prime land up in Daily Mount. You get up in a drone and you look, that's prime land. That's to be utilized. You know, not necessarily the pitch, maybe for a couple of concerts, you know, to because to, you destroy the pitch, but retail around it, right? Bars, restaurants, bring people into it. Hospitality for match days. Look, I, I know nothing about Greyhounds and you live up the road. I've been in Shelbourne Park maybe five, six times. Nice meal, you know, pick a, 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 a grey, I wouldn't have a, a clue on that. I'm not a betting man. But brilliant nights out. We need to attract people. I go to rugby, don't I? I know nothing about rugby. Yeah. I go to Aviva for the internationals, right? Great day out. I don't know what's happening, but I, I just like it. So we need to attract those people, as you say, as a, from a commercial perspective. We need to attract those people as well. But also, from a player's point of view on the pitch, you don't want the right keen scenario. If you're in daily with 5,000 people, you want to hear 3,000 chanting your name Absolutely. Yeah. Or, or, or cheering. Because it's all part of, how can I say, it's a theatre. Yeah. It's like a theatre and everyone's part of it. And that's what they have to really try and create when they build it. Get the acoustics right in the small stadiums. Keep the lights 100%. 100%. <laughs> okay, we're keeping the lights. And then, then you know what you should do then? Move the two chimneys up from each <laughs> There you go, stick Put them the as goals. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Play up that way in the first <laughs> half. But it's not just uh, Daily Mount. It just look at, was it Dundalk last year? Wasn't it the owner fell through the chair and stuff like that? Some of the facilities around the league. I do, we don't want to bash, but uh, I'm just chatting about overall message. Everything leads a little bit of an improvement in, in terms of that, especially when we're getting numbers in the gate now. Well, I play for Dundalk. Right, so I was in the home dressing room. And then I managed in Dundalk. And with the amount of substitutes now, you can't fit a squad into a dressing room in Dundalk with bags, with kit. You can't fit them in. Wow. If the ass fellas go out and have a walk and everything, it's horrendous. And that hasn't changed. And I always found, Keith, and I don't know if you agree with me and, and, and you, Donica, when I sat to sign a player, I tell them all the facilities we have, medical, uh, uh, strength conditioning, every single thing we can give the kit, best of kit, everything, then I discuss money. Because I know yeah. the ones that you want on your side, look, the money will come. And yeah. If they walk and go, well, I want this, yeah, yeah get yeah, lost. No and we don't have that ability to do that. When I was manager of Rovers, I brought people to Crow Park under construction and said, we're going to be sharing that stadium and it's finished. But come in and share where we have to play them in a the Park. <laughs> and true. when I went to Daly, I, keep, I always brought people in through the car park side. Because when you walked in the big stand, that was your visuals. You're, you're like the equivalent to highest in bouquet. You know, you but want you from keeping up appearances. Yeah, I, do, I, do, I, do. I don't fault it. But no, it's all a perception. You have to do that. I, I got him a free membership for, what's that place? Temple Bar Hotel downstairs, Bus Street. You know, the, yeah. the nightclub, Robbie Dunn was my yeah, pal. Robbie, yeah. Robbie ran the door. So I brought him and yeah. said, right, son, you've signed. There's your contract. There's your membership card for the nightclub. Well, you, you get meant to be keeping them out of there. No, listen. <laughs> listen, <laughs> don't like Go in there, your VIP every Saturday night if you fancy it. Right? Sunday morning, Robbie, who was in last night? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'll tell you who was locked. <laughs> and they all thought, Jay's Rod's great. I brought them on, everyone to Louis Copeland's. I say, Louis, if you any grave diggers over the coast downstairs, we can't get rid of yet. Yeah, of a couple of young ones here, we'll fit them out. But it, that was it. Yeah. 
Is there a push, lads, towards Dublin, though? You know what I mean? If we look at just economics, money-wise, we look at the amount of teams in the league, like we see it, of course, with Limerick and Hurling, Kerry with football, people will migrate, you know, where the, it's been played more and the level is a little bit higher. Are we in danger of probably losing the league to more Dublin uh, teams as opposed to an overall strategy for the whole country? We don't know. Um, I think it was great last year with Cork coming back in. Good now, Galway coming in. They're great football clubs. Yeah. And yeah. we're talking about with the facilities and your team folks on the playing pitch. Like you look at them, Doc, when they how, far, how like successful they were under Stephen there seven eight years ago. And like it should be a thing that I think it's an IX model where a certain amount of percentage you earn on the income is redistributed into the club. There has to be some kind of that. Like yeah. where you don't have owners coming in, taking their share, and out they go, and then the club's let to rot. You yeah. know. Yeah. But, I don't know in the Dublin that, as you say, like. It's all changed now. I don't know what you were back in your time when you when you were signing players. Like clubs have to house these players now. Also, like it's yeah, coming okay. so like it's, it's so like expensive to actually for lads to come and rent. Yeah. Like we players come from Poland, Estonia. They want to bring their their wives, their girlfriends, yeah. and then that's another expense on top of things as well. Yeah. Like, but yeah. again, these are the kind of things that if you want to push, you need to get good players in. You have to look after that. So you know thing about it? we have the population. Yeah, we we'll get the players if you can get the accommodation. And uh, it's always going to be the strongest. And 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 also, Donica, if you look at Cork, Derry, when they won their leagues, I would say sixty percent were Dublin based players, not Dublin based, but yeah, Dublin okay. players yeah. that would travel down to play for these. Uh, born uh, you know what I mean? The, the, these uh, rural, not rural, but these clubs in the other provinces. You know. You mentioned the finances. Just looking at players that have have gone, the likes of Evan Ferguson, the the implications that has for a club. You know, could that nearly knock the whole league out of kilter? A big sale of a player like that. He was with us when he came through. He was only fourteen years of age, but you're saying knock the set. Like, I think there's one club that's going to be a little bit cautious with money. Is is boss? If you look yeah, around yeah. the whole league, in terms of that, I don't think the um directly or whatever they get if it's a sell-on class for having straight into the playing squad I think they're going to like recently enough they purchased the Oscar Trainer um, centre yeah. you seen that yeah. pitch at the back and there's a, there's a redevelopment of that going on probably in two years then then they have DCU another 15 year lease there yeah. also like it's the club's grown but I couldn't see them throwing big money at the playing squad obviously it would help um, yeah. but if he does go I hope he goes soon but enough but can be prudent and successful as well you see this is where everyone thinks the biggest budget is going to win it. it'll give you the best chance yeah. But if you have a prudent manager who's, who's a good motivator and he's clued in tactically and he knows how to win championships, right? You can do it on a lesser budget. Yeah. There's people, Absolutely. you know, and a, and a bigger budget brings its pressure as well because, you know, you're expected to, like Rovers have a, probably the biggest budget and um, they're expected to win it. But um, yeah, it's, you know, you have to marry both. You have to have success. Yeah. I don't care what anyone says. I'm a football manager. I played football. And all I ever done every day scoop was to win. But not to win at all, class. And I, I'm saying it again. I left Bowes in a profit. I left Carlisle in a profit. I left Mon in a profit. And I left Atlone in a profit. Now, it was only five grand at loan. It wasn't a deficit. Bowes was 800 grand. Finished their stand. Carlisle was 750 grand. So you can be successful, as you call success, keeping them in the league. You can be successful, Donegan. Right, or and be prudent. Yeah, and that's the balance you need to be. But finance matters, doesn't it? Even Absolutely. a run in Europe now as well, yeah. like that could really bolster yeah. your team and your squad, yeah. couldn't it? Yeah. Well, it does. And what you said about Evan Ferguson, when the money comes in there, that will stay with Bowes. So hopefully, then they will step up to the mark and equal Rovers. But this is where back in the day, you see, the thing in England. When I was in England, they'd say that league is bankrupt. Right, keep bookies at Bowes. We have for five grand. Just take the hand off you for okay. that. And, and do you know what happened? You would have went for five grand. That's mm. what was happening. And I remember buying Darren Kelly from Derry and they said, um, uh, Michael Knighton was the chairman and he said to me, no, he wasn't, Courtney was, I bought, <laughs> I bought Richie Ford for a hundred grand off Talgan. I haven't got two pence <laughs> off Shell. I haven't got two pence. We were in the administration but I Thank winged it and got him. for the non-disclosure, Robbie. Fair I, play it's you. okay. I winged, <laughs> I winged it and signed him and we got him 15. We went into administration. But, um, the thing about it is, back in the day, like Roy Kane, uh, the, the kid off uh, Sligo, what's his name? Plays for everything. Seamus Coleman. Seamus Coleman. They, they were laughing at us in England. I bought Darren Kelly for 100 grand. He was the best league of Ireland centre half in the country. And they said, I'll offer 20. I said, no. No, he's worth 100 grand. So I tried to create a yeah, market. A market. Mm. And uh, we got him, you know, but it was, and there was no sell on clauses or anything like that. You know what I mean? 
But this this is all changing. You know, you've experienced people like Damien Duff yeah. and uh, Stephen Bradley. They know the game. They've been around England, you know. You've mentioned COVID and people want to get back out. What about Brexit? Has that distorted the league in terms of talent pushing across? Are you seeing it with your playing yeah. pool? Yeah, absolutely. And it's becoming a, a genuine younger league, I think, as well. Mm. You know, I think it's a great thing that, you know, I know one or two lads that have uh, gone away young and they regret 16 years of age. Like, they're yeah, kids. Okay. Yeah. And they come back at 21, 22 when they feel a failure because they weren't ready. Yeah. So now you have these young lads that probably wait until 18, 19 if they get a chance to go away. They're like blooded into the first team. Yeah. They're seeing what an actual men's dressing room is and how you have to train, how you apply yourself. And going across, it puts them in a better, like, they look at themselves and say, you know, I am ready. Like, I know one lad it personally torn down the move last year because he wasn't ready, he said. And he's yeah. 18, and that's like brave enough decision. And it was a good yeah. contract. And he says, no, I'm not ready. I want to try and achieve in a forced team environment forced yeah. and then head away yeah. and, and going away then they're going into a forced team environment because yeah. a lot of them didn't go away 18 going 20 trees and that's nothing for yeah, it's is a brutal it? league it's, 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 but the other thing about it is you've brave managers now like you've got uh, John Daly up in Pats yeah. and put a 16 year old in you've got them down in Daly Mount when uh, thing was printed as a kid 16 play this year did he? 16 uh, year Nixon yeah you know, so Evan was 14 blooded in and yeah. there was a lot of controversy that saying he was yeah. he was um, only a kid, but yeah. he was as big as anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you need the managers to be. But then again, on the other side of that, Donegal, you have managers under severe pressure, yeah. and they go. Hold yeah, on a minute. Great. You mentioned him, Stephen Kenny. Like he was the nearly the pin up for the league. Just the way that all panned out. You know what I mean? Did you think it was nearly bad for the league that it showed the kind of calibre within the the, the coaching setup? That of course, anybody working in League of Ireland could step up to an international. Uh, team Ireland team what about Nobody. Stephen Bradley no 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 because people have to understand right management is um, obviously getting your players around you getting your tactics right right but the most important thing is game management and the higher you go like in Europe yeah. you don't get five minutes no. you don't see something go, oh Jesus you see something you've got to change it within a minute or two You've got to adopt quick. And that's where Stephen's downfall was. And I said it, he's, he's, brilliant, at, he's brilliant at spotting talent. He's obviously a good motivator. He has like ability, which is a huge plus. But when it came to game management, I've done forensic analysis on a lot of the games and I'm screaming, I'm throwing slippers at the television. I'll, Jesus, quick, 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 quick. One, one, all. Two, one, three, one. And you're going, ah. And then it's, it's repetitive. And then not only you're, you're looking at the man, you're looking at the coach and staff, you're going, hold on a minute. Tap him on the shoulder, say, boss, yeah, okay. We're going to be slaughtered down that side. You need more. to, uh, and that's it's like boxing. Yeah, the higher you go in boxing, the quicker you go, right? You don't see a flaw, right? Or you, 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 you show a flaw, you're knocked out. And I'm sure it's no, it's international rugby, international rugby, one error, it's a strike. That's it, one mistake. That's it. And, and I'm not talking about a big error, it's just a slight. Second, yeah, but that's see. I'm not. I, I walked. I, I won the double. Well, we won the double. The players, obviously, and, and the coaching staff and all that in 33 months. Could I manage Ireland? Not in a million years. And we went out to Europe and beat a German team on merit, and we knocked Aberdeen out on merit, right? But that didn't qualify me to be an international manager because you need to walk at the highest level where the tempo of the game is like that. So it's that you're not, oh, geez, oh, one nil, you're going, hold on, we can, and you have to preempt everything and be switched on and game management the other stuff like you fellas that head coaches to go into that right but you fellas that stand in the dugout and they see things before anyone else and they're the most important ones on the match day but it's amazing you said I go straight back to an example we played France in Crow Park we were playing incredibly well just one in one part of the game one person took line speed at yeah. a different rate to the yeah. rest one slight foot ahead yeah. and, and Clark a brilliant winger able to expose yeah. them and I always think of it, it you're right the air is thin the higher you go up ah. it's not like it makes it so so difficult well, you even look at the, the top level, right? The ball flies into you, mm. right? And you don't get three touches. Like the kid that's playing for, he played for Derby for a while and he played for Ireland. He's playing for Bristol City now, is it? He's from Bray. Jason Great Knight. kid. Determined the whole lot. Needs three touches every single time. You, you'll never get that at the top level. 
Boom, and it's gone. And you know, you're going to know what you're doing before it comes. And it comes uh, in, in Premier League football or European football, uh, away games. We, there's no sprinklers in Ireland. Away games. It's like a bar of soap yeah, on is. a Greek ice rink. And if your touch is not impeccable, you're finished. It's, and do you know what my best ally was when I won the double? Sean Edwards. No way. Sean came to me, he stayed with me for about six weeks. And wow. he actually trained on the pitch with us. And he was doing this rush stuff with wasps at the yeah. time. And he said to me, he said to me, always said to me, Rod, defence wins championships. Defence wins. And that that's not being an obstacle team behind the ball. It means where you defend and you defend and you do it right. And the, and the art of defending and add a bit of flair to it. You know, so people have to understand, you know, Keith has attributes. I've seen him probably making his debut or there or thereabouts. And I've seen what his attributes were. And you can play at 40. Because he doesn't charge all over the place. Yeah. But he does it right, Kane. He gets other people to charge all over the place. He knows when to drop. He knows when to game manage. And I was at the game last week. And if Keith had been on the pitch, they wouldn't have lost or drawn. No way. Just on that, Keith, though, because you, you've crossed over. You mentioned it earlier on from you were working in the trade. Just how has professionalism led to your life being different? You know, the lifestyle balance. Have you got that? You know what? I'm a man and need to be like kept busy. I actually have too much time sometimes now. You know, you finish training at half one, two o'clock. And yeah. I don't necessarily like it. Um, yeah. I actually enjoy it um, when I was walking, getting up at six o'clock in the morning. You did go to the gym before if I walk, do you walk seven to four, seven to five? Then you head off the train three, four nights a week, you play a match and then the weekends you're busy with training. Also. Oh, I enjoyed that more but my body didn't. Like yeah, I was 20, 27 playing and I could feel it through games, you know, at the day or two later. But now I'm actually, since I'm full time last year, I've never felt sore after a game once and it's because of I used to Rest recovery yeah. exactly yeah. and the only one time I've ever I, funny story there you're talking about work that he knows uh, John so uh, he would play with a lad John Told who he's uh, probably going to be father a lot uh, down the line but uh, he was away and i never forget it we were playing um, do the launch in Europe so he was away um, and I was looking after the job and the other fellow walking was didn't drive so Wednesday night you played them beat them got through in Europe the next night, I'm up at half six in the morning. Wow. And I remember having a dead leg, getting up the ladder. And the other lads and old lads, so he couldn't drive, I couldn't hide then. I was getting the lad taken out. And then I remember the, the fellow saying, he says, yeah, welcome to Irish football. I, I got off a scaffolding in Ring's End. Got off a scaffolding, went home, had a shower, went to the airport. We played Standard Liège in Belgium, right? And I remember we drew, we, 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 they beat us 3-2 in that loan and it was a respectable result. They had three World Cup winner, uh, winners in the team. We got there, right? I got off a scout and I went over played and they battered us. They absolutely annihilated us. I, I touched the ball eight times, right? And that was eight tip-offs. They beat us eight more. <laughs> oh, and I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it, Dunnigan, right? <laughs> so I need this key, right? So the fellow up front of me was Michael O'Connor and he looked up and he goes, Lovely Raleigh says, we'll be out here in 10 minutes. I said, no, that's the scoreboard. <laughs> it's 8 nothing, right? But the other thing, when the game was over, there was a fella like you, Donny, he was a gladiator, about six foot four. <laughs> Big shock of oily black hair, right? And he stripped off, right? And he was like chiseled out of marble. And he said to me, you swap the jays. And I looked around about 40, 30 odd thousand in the ground. I go, why did he grow up the tunnel here, you know? I know definition of muscle snow. I, I the shape of a vest. You know the vest from being on the scaffolding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big red shoulders and a big white belly, you know what I mean? So I said, we'll do it up the yeah. tunnel. So I'll never get out. I gave up the tunnel and I gave him. And I went to put the jays on. We sat in the dressing room. The manager came in and And he was ripping the devil. And he comes to me and he goes, where'd you get that fucking jersey? <laughs> And I went, what? Where'd you get the jays? I says, the chap asked me to swap. <laughs> well, go in and get it back. We need that for Sunday. That's the truth. Now, I didn't go in, but when I, I got a St. Anthony's medal on my mother-in-law, St. Anthony's, the, the patron saint of yeah. last causes, right? And when I gave the jays in, it was on it. When I got it back, medal was gone. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to face the mother-in-law as well. I got done for a medal. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's what it was like. Yeah. yeah. And then the lads are going to lash. Yeah, okay. I remember we went to Brussels to the airport and the lads were poured onto the floor. Yeah, but it was the time. You know, it was different times. Over, so yeah. But see, when you go to Europe, all you wanted was Cyprus, Portugal, Spanish club, anywhere where the sun <laughs> was. You didn't care. And when I went on my first trip with Bowles, we played in the stadium like, against uh, Sporting Lisbon. And I have a picture of seen yesterday. We went to, to, to Portugal in September in woolly jumpers, short and tie, 
blazers. The sweat was beating Elvis over there. You know, yeah. they didn't plan ahead, get them for that, I'll deal with the rest of the season. <laughs> but, but look, we got through it. And, yeah. You know, I, 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 I really think it's brilliant for the kids now, you know. Keith, I'll go to you first. Bulls would be seen as the Dublin club. Would that be a kind of fair reflection or is it just around your club? They're my club, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, but I'm sure you have all supporters will claim the Dubs clubs, Shells, Bowes, yeah. Pats, you know, and you have Shells and, and the Rovers fighting over who owns rings in, you know, down the road from where I am. But as you said, to me, Bowes is a Dublin club, you know, and, yeah. you know, and there is like there's two derbies as we talked about today, but there's only really one derby in Dublin Derby and you'll know yeah, it is Bowser Rovers you yeah. know you have other clubs that can yeah. try and push it but let's be honest there is only one real Dublin Derby but isn't that great to have that rivalry you like they, that's not made or like that is mm. real you know what I mean you grow up in that no 100% and I think probably in the last 5 to 10 years the probably the hatred I think is going out a little bit in terms yeah, yeah. of where you can't tackle as much then the influx of foreign players coming in they don't see it as much if they're not around a long time you know so yeah. It might be as hard at hitting the tackles as both then the product and the, the playing pitch is getting better, as you say. Well, I managed and played for both clubs. And it was brilliant. I made my debut back from England for Bowes against Rovers. No, Rovers against Bowes scored the winner. And then I managed Rovers when we beat Bowes one night, 3-2. And then I managed Bowes when we were 4-1 down at half time. Stop rubbing it in. I haven't heard that <laughs> one. Yeah, yeah, here we go. <laughs> I'm still dining out on that one. So a great rivalry. And if you're ever going to get the bullet in the club, Bowls or Rovers and you're on uh, tin ice lose that fixture yeah, okay. and it's justified oh, by the support yeah. I don't care <laughs> get them out three times we, I think it was Stephen Kenny Trevor Crowley and then I, I, when we beat them the next yeah. day they were gone yeah yeah. well we were falling down I was told at half time you're getting sacked at the final whistle <laughs> yeah, oh my god you're joking who no, said no it's here it's in the book it's in the book <laughs> I was walking up and Jim Fitz told me Jim Fitz Padge remember we were actually feeling oh, wow. he was my ally he was my man on the board I was walking up, 4-1 down, Rovers having a party. The ball supporters were leaving Santry Stadium at the time, mm, the, yeah. the Santry Stadium. And I'm walking up and Jim Coach is rather second at the final whistle. So I dipped into all my coaching and managerial knowledge and all. I went into Jackson, how are you done? I said, Dad, give us a dig out. <laughs> <laughs> Throws the bone. <laughs> Dad, come on. And I went in and we banged him over, 6-4. Wow. And we beat them 6-4. We scored five in the second half. And what happened was, and we blitzed them in the second half. And the ones that were sacking me, I walked up. And it was the only time in my life in football to get such a result like that, that I was sad, frustrated, happy, numb. Yes. Every emotion on the planet. I couldn't even go for a point after. I thought, what is this all about? Mm. You know what I mean? But only sport can do that. Isn't That's it? great. It's yeah. great. It's yeah. great. You Probably know? just, so you, you touched on it there, but being like nearly the pantomime villain and yeah. the, the saviour of different clubs, how have you found that? You know I what I mean? It. Do you? Ah, yeah. We, 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 when I was manager of Bowls, I didn't even, I never went to see anyone play or anything like that. I just dictate what you had. But I'd wear pinstripe suits and, you know, and spats and all that. They'd go mad. They'd all slaughter me. But I loved the crack. Yeah, I yeah. loved it. And I'd call out managers. But Ollie Bourne used to ring me and say, Rod, get on the red. Isn't Joe Duffy one day? And Joe Duffy says, Jesus. I oh know, Jerry Ryan. Jerry Ryan says, Jesus, I don't go to football. I ain't going to Talca Park tonight. All your dreams say, Rob, we need crowds and we need a few quid. So I'd start saying mad stuff and calling out the manager. I'm going to knock him out and all that. And next of all, <laughs> place to be full. And that's what it was. But you're a, you're a clown if you're not winning. Yeah. But when you're winning, you get away with it. But you've earned the ride as well. You broke your leg. We were chatting outside four times. Four times. It? And there was a time you, a, a really bad concussion, was it? Uh, yeah. I got anointed. I got uh, the last rights off uh, the man that writes in the Sunday world. No way. The last rights? Yeah, the last rights, yeah. Wow. The last, I mean, it is. I know when I broke my leg, can I tell you a rugby story? Yes, yes. I broke my leg up in Belfield and I got brought to the Mead Hospital and Ireland were playing that afternoon in Lansdowne Road and I was in there and my leg was all over the shop and next of all there's another cubicle in there and a fellow was brought in so next of all I'm I'm uh, brought in oh, sorry a doctor comes in and he starts really pulling at me ribs and I'm going no 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 me leg me leg is in bits oh. and the man in the other cubicle I won't name him he's an international route place says I'm in fucking here you fucking idiot <laughs> it was an international from the Lansdowne Irish to come with a broken rib <laughs> so the other thing yeah I went up with I was playing we were playing Rovers up in Milltown I was playing with the dog we were touching goal to win the league and balls were flying through the air then and Torlick said to me Rod 
if you can't get there, just challenge. Just break them yeah. up, you know what I mean? So I was jumping up, but I jumped up and Mick Neville was coming out and I jumped up to challenge, but he came straight up and he smashed me right in the back of the head. Wow. And all I remember was hitting the ground and everything in my body going like that. It was like an epileptic fit. My leg was going like that, my arms were going down. Couldn't talk. And all I remember was Damon Keeley standing over me. And I was going, and then they come over and they, they I conked out anyway. And then they took me out in a stretcher. I swallowed my tongue, they sorted that one out. And then I was about, I think I was unconscious for about 15 minutes. And my wife came around with her, her sister, Ellen, who just lost her husband. And she said, Jesus, Carolyn, I hope you're not going to be widowed like me. So they came and they wouldn't let Carolyn in. And my, Michael Darcy, is that his name? He's a priest anyway. Okay. He came in. I don't remember this, but he had the, he was doing the last wow. rites in the whole lot. And then I woke up in, I think it could have been the, the one up in Mead Street, the Mead Hospital, is that what they got it? And yeah, Jeez, that was it. Wow, yeah. wow, wow. <laughs> you know, and that was my fourth concussion. Wow. I talked talking about rugby and that. Yeah, yeah, but it was different. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to be harsh, yeah. but the knowledge around it, you probably didn't even know with the soccer balls at that time. It's you a know, it's mad. It's, it's, Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's a worry. Horrendous. But even for you, someone like you, Keith, it will finish. Are you preparing yourself? You, like you've had a taste of it. You've worked before, but are you preparing yourself for life after soccer? Yeah, so I am um, like to have a tray behind me, good which on. is good. Yeah. I'm also, uh, I'm just finished my B licence. I'm going to get involved now like that. You can never have time during your career to actually get involved. You usually, when you finish your career, you have a year doing your licence, then you get involved with him. Yeah. Of time to kill now. I might as well get involved with the, yeah. the 17s or the 15s or 19s. Good on so then, down the line, that I hopefully then have my own little business going and also then be managing, but and coaching, but as aspirations go, I would be like the manager of Ireland one day. You Brilliant. know, and Brilliant. people may say, you never be that. Well, that's okay. Yeah. But well, that's my dream. That's where I want to go. If I don't get it, no problem. Good that's where you. I'm going to aim for. Donald, can I just finish on yeah, something? Absolutely. I caught my grandson after you. Yeah. No way. Yeah, it's in the book. No way. God love him. <laughs> and we did. And I'm disappointed they didn't say, How are you, pal? When I walked in, <laughs> I met Donald up in City West when you were doing Oh, Happy days. I'm in Reynard's one night locked. You was up there playing someone. <laughs> and he was rolling the corner. Well, you weren't there, obviously. Well, I, I used to go in to get him out. <laughs> and I was well oiled. Right? <laughs> and they're all there. And next of all, I looked over and I said to Carolyn, I said, Carolyn, there's the man I called uh, Donica, I mean, my daughter. I said, oh, Jesus, yeah. And I went, oh, all right, big man. I said, I called me, me grandson after you and Shane said to me, Shane's a lovely name. And I looked up and said, Shane Oregon. <laughs> I, I already remember the light and the, the height. And I think, it's not too, I know he's a big way. It always but, happens. Ah, that's the truth. And it, it comes both ways because I actually get the, the up from that side of it. He scored the most amazing try when Ireland beat England. Yeah, Luke Crow Crow in the corner. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ron O'Gara a crossfield yeah. kick yeah, and he yeah. scores it. It's it most brilliant. Uh, yeah, and everyone keeps coming up to me. <laughs> that try you got in Crow Park was unbelievable over there. Thanks a million. <laughs> and you know what? Take it. Roddy, what, what's next for you? What's next for you? We, we saw you on the Tommy Tierney show. Well done. You were brilliant on it. You were so honest, so open. But what, what, what are you looking forward to? I look forward to everything. I'm not, I'm not being calm. No, I know right? that. I'm you... just living the happiest time in my life. As I was saying the game when you were playing, you come in to me and said, last quarter, lads, throw caution to the wind. Whatever happens, happens. You get a win, a draw, or a loss, but let's throw caution to the wind. And at this moment in time, you know, I'm all right. I have a great wife, of beautiful kids, of great grand. I just, I just have it all. Yeah. I have it all at the minute. I'm, I'm living the dream. I walk for Ireland. I, what I do is I try to dedicate myself and my wife's time to staying as fit and healthy and enjoying myself as much as possible. And I'd love another job. And now Raoul, you'll call us out. And I'd love, I would love another manager's job. However, I might have to pay for the club myself. Oh, and here that, we go. Dot, dot, dot. More as we money. have it. Small money. So there's a club in England that had me eye on that I could take. And I would love to do that. But do you know what? As I said to Tommy Tiernan, I don't plan ahead. Yeah. I don't. You're in I, don't, don't, don't I don't plan you ahead. I moment. really don't. I live in the moment with as much responsibility as I can. Right. But um, I just hope I live long enough to, to get another job. I love them. Yeah. We didn't touch on Stephen, obviously, but yeah, it just, champ. yeah, it was an incredible time. It was an incredible time, wasn't it, around our oh, sport? Oh, my God. Just... His film is coming out on Netflix now in the next couple of weeks, and it's called One Night in Mill Street. Yeah, amazing. Right. I sit down, and I can't believe that's my little brother. Yeah. And to, you know, like you said, I can't be the manager of Ireland. You can be anything you want to be, Keith. Yeah. 
You come in here, you want to be. Stephen, you say, I'm going to be a world champion. I'd never say, I'm not going to be. I'm going to say, oh, jeez, I hope he does, you know, for because yeah. they've already put in. Anyway, get it back what you put in. You, you read, went to the heights with the Lions too and all that. It was just unreal. Mill Street for me will never be replicating anything in my life as in pride. And that's not disrespect to Carolyn having five no. children. I've never experienced pride in my life ever since or before that when that was my brother. Yeah. Know, it was unbelievable. And it's still brilliant, you know. It gives me goosebumps because it was your brother, but it, it felt like all of us. It was it was the first moment, and I I, I hate doing it, but it, there was always that chip, uh, Ireland versus England, yeah, and like yeah. we didn't see Eubank as Eubank, yeah. we saw him as England. Yeah. You know what I mean? And Steve standing there and just yeah. doing it twice. You know what I mean? It was magic. And a Parky Quaid the second time, and coming out to out Roche in the Rahal, it was yeah. just unbelievable. Great times. You know? Brilliant, brilliant. And then we got a good stretch of it. We went to, um, then I, I was in the world champion belt, Kerry, I am now, that's my new title. And we went and we had, we had the time <laughs> of our lives. Dead right. And I had a goatee at the time and I was mistaken for Stephen many times, purposely, right? <laughs> I was in Browns. I know you were never in yeah, there. Yeah. I know you were never in there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, no, I, I don't know where it is. I did the Browns in, in the West End with Caroline and uh, another lad, John Swift, and, 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 his, and his wife. Um, they looked down the taxi, said the taxi driver, tell him the champ is in the car, gave him a price for a drink. We have the champ. Steve, come on, come on, mate, come on. I remember going up the stairs. And Naomi Campbell's there, and your man out Spandu Bally, who my wife thought was brilliant. Oh, wow. Big fella. What's his name? Spandu Bally. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so I was giving it the champ. Everyone thought it was Stephen. I even thought it was Stephen, right? <laughs> Free champagne and everything. And I remember Naomi Campbell sitting on me and he, I remember a bouncer touched me on the shoulder going, You all right, mate? And I go, Am I all right? I'm from Cabra. He <laughs> says, Naomi Campbell's on me and he, Spandu Bally's dancing around me, missus. Are you having a laugh? Free champagne. You were asking me, Am I all right? It doesn't get any better than this, you know. But we great times and then we all came to an end. It was the right time for Stephen. Love he has it. his faculties and his field, Bob, and that's Brilliant. all that matters, you know. Roddy, never Never change, never change. Honestly, you bleed late now. <laughs> no, honestly, thanks for being honestly an unbelievable personality, not only within your sport but in general. Good on you, keep going, and we're delighted to have you today as well. Keith, speedy recovery to you. Looking forward to seeing you back out on the pitch and keep going, whatever comes yep. your way. We wish you nothing but success. Thanks so Thank much, you. lads, for joining us on the podcast today. Welcome back to Under Construction. It is time for our Suppliers Corner. And joining Patrick and myself today is Richard Sloan from Sunus. Richard, how are you? Very well, Dunnicke. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. I know Patrick knows it inside out, but you might give us a brief overview of Sunus. Yeah, so Sunus Bathrooms will be probably Ireland's leading and largest single bathroom brand. Uh, we started from humble beginnings 1978, and one man kind of went on a journey of bathroom, selling bathroom products to merchants all around the country. And I suppose the business as it stands today employs well over 100 people in our Dublin HQ. Oh. So essentially how I'd best describe it is we design, manufacture and distribute bathroom products into the retail market. So obviously Chadwick's being a very important retail partner, a long-standing customer of ours. And then servicing really the different addressable markets. So people involved in refurbishing a bathroom or building a new home, any of the self-build projects, all the way through to, you know, new house builds, you know, on the larger developer scale and then commercial type projects as well. So we've a, pretty much a, a broad reach across all those demographics. So bathrooms have become such a sophisticated part of the of the house, you know, and and you talk to developers and they'll always say to you, bathrooms and kitchens sell houses, you know, because that's that's it. My 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 dad said to me, rest of me, he said, geez, ever since they brought the bathrooms inside and the food outside, the world's gone a bit bonkers, you know. But <laughs> what a because, great life. <laughs> <laughs> because that's that's how it used to be, you know. But now it's they're they're so important, they're so integral into the design of a house and, and how it looks. And it's the fashion business, really. It really is. But I suppose the, the level of consideration that goes into bathrooms now is really come on so much. Uh, I was even thinking about this coming over. Like when I was growing up as a kid, like you one bathroom in the house, you know, and, you know, the idea of a shower was a couple of rubber, you know, connectors yeah. onto the taps. Right. Whereas now, you know, the, OK, the kitchen is considered the heart of the home, but really the bathrooms are integral. And, you know, there's, there's often multiple bathrooms now when people's homes. The kitchen's homes, the heart, the bathrooms you escape. Yeah, yeah, well, now you have it. But I suppose people are so much more demanding of the bathroom in terms of what they want from it. Uh, you know, so it's obviously, it, look, it serves lots of obvious functions. We, we, we know that. But as you said, rightly, Patrick, it is a place, 
of escape. Uh, and people like to unwind, I suppose, the morning routine, the evening routine. Yeah, and people's just expectations from their bathroom, not just from a functionality point of view, but as you rightly said, from a design and a style point of view, it gives an opportunity to people to bring some of their own, you know, kind of fashion identity and style identity into the home. Yeah, and I know, like we we have we have showrooms in in pretty much every location, and but there's the vast range that is out there. You know, whether it's a big bathroom or a small bathroom, where you're trying to fit it into a caboose under the stairs or whatever it is, like the range is is extensive. And I know you have a fantastic showroom that I've been in myself, and uh, we we regularly send people to if they're you know starting from with a completely blank canvas and and. Uh, uh, just to start giving them some ideas. Yeah, the purpose for the showroom really is to help people on that journey. It's probably like a pre-purchase support. So naturally, all of our products would be sold through our retail network and obviously the, the national coverage that Chadwick's have. People the length of breadth of Ireland can, can buy our product through one of your locations. But you guys have restrictions in terms of space and how much product you can show. So the reason we're having the showroom at our own headquarters, it gives an opportunity to show all of the products, the full range. It's quite diverse, as you said, so much variation size, colour, uh, different finishes. So we kind of say to people, look, it's about touch, feel and compare. So we have three qualified people. They're our product experts. Yeah. And they're really there just to hold the hand of the consumer or the trade guy for that matter. And, you know, we'd often have tradespeople either bring their clients with them or sometimes send the clients up and we'll actually do a lot of that heavy lifting around getting the product specification nailed down. And you'll often come away with a few questions to answer. You'll, you, you won't always nail it down on your first visit. We do encourage people to bring dimensions with them. It's the biggest mistake people make. And when they arrive, they just realise we are, start asking about well, what size is your bathroom on the course. They don't, yeah. they don't realise what it is. So we see it as a bit of a collaboration between obviously the client has a desire in terms of what they hope to achieve. We're there to support them around features and the benefits of the product really and why things you might go for one product over another. And then you have to dovetail that back down with the man or the woman who's actually going to go and the various trades who will install the bathroom. Because if you get it right, you know, you should have a long, long, you know, 15, 20 years of enjoyment uh, from your bathroom. But if you get it wrong, it can be a costly mistake. And we want to try and prevent that for people. That's the beauty of the showroom, though, isn't it? Like you mentioned there, it, we we all want it to be functional, but our all, our styles are different. Yeah. And I, I, I remember myself personally when it came to our bathroom where the feel mattered to me, the touch. And you know what I mean? I, like Jenny would give me a slagging over it. It, it turns donors. And I was there, no, it's the way it does. Yeah. <laughs> so You're it, dead right on that, Donegal, because we, we've worked with some great interior designers over the years and one in particular who I've done a lot of collaboration with and one of the things she would always encourage her clients is how do you want the space to feel because most people focus on the visuals and they have their Instagram and all their different kind of visuals that they bring in but essentially you know all of that interior design evokes a feeling mm. and you want to kind of get that right as well But we're a country who embraced colour in bathrooms years ago decades the avocado green and the, <laughs> yes. and the salmon pink uh, bathrooms they were all there you know and See my please don't tell me no. the avocado green's coming back It is in a, in a, in a version I mean we, we do offer a range of colours in ceramics I suppose the difference now is I suppose back then when you were referring to, to those designs it was kind of like a full colour wash everything was the one colour now it's about kind of blending colours and different metals and finishes uh, but colour is and vibrant colour like we, we you know we offer a range of furniture which is probably where people start now from a product selection point of view because really storage is so important you know some you know consumer surveys that we've run ourselves and nearly 60% of people don't have enough storage people just have so much stuff now right the blokes are taking up as much space as the Worse, girls yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Worse, I'd say you've loads of hair products <laughs> now that need to be he's, 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 I don't he's <laughs> diverting don't be fooled by the hair he's a big manscaper <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, we do need storage. So I suppose the furniture piece is is really where people start. That's like a focal point. And, and you get getting, a bit of pop of colour coming in there. You get a pop of colour in there. Yeah. And then you're, kind of, you're building around that theme then in terms of, you know, the, the, the metal finishes, the different colours. Uh, and whereas chrome was kind of all in for years and that's all you, it was the go-to colour. Now you've got your brush brass, your golds, your blacks is really a staple colour now. My mum is in her 80s. She'll kill me for saying that. But we, we renovated her bathroom last year and off her own bath. She selected all black taps and black showers and there was no kind of pushing for me. So it just goes to show, you know, like uh, at every age now, people recognise, you know, that the bathroom is a space that they want to get the design right. And Richard, your mom has good taste. I went for a black bathroom as well. You've got I'm great taste as well. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I think it's very much it's here to stay. I'm probably blending you know, different colours now, like whereas you, you don't have to have all your, your metal finishes in black. People are mixing metals as well. I see electronics and, and you know, being able to 
turn your turn your um, shower on from the bed, you know, before you get up and set the temperature so that it's just piping hot when you walk into yeah, it. Yeah, and again, is that a big big trend? Yeah, well, it's a growing trend. Certainly in the UK market, we would say they're far more developed around smart technology and digital showering mm-hmm. than we would be in in the Irish market. But I do see it as a as a growing trend. Uh, I think sustainability then is something that's important for a lot of consumers as well, and certainly as a bathroom brand who sells a lot of products over the course of a year that, you know, use water, uh, we're doing our best as well to try and, I suppose, optimise the design of those products to consume less water. Mm. So we would have, you know, we're a, a member of the Irish Green Building Council. We're a voluntary member of the Unified Water Label in the UK. And that's a, a way of registering and designing the products to meet like like an A-rated standard. So again, taking the, the maximum flush on a toilet down from six and four litres down to four and 2.5 makes a material difference to your water consumption. So trying to put some of these technologies in there as added value Mm -hmm. because the consumer, while they want it, they don't necessarily want to pay, you know, double the price for it. So trying to find some of this added value in the product design to give that benefit and help people save water over, over the course of a year. Richard, advice for, say, a builder or a contractor with their client, what should they be thinking to help get going? Obviously, you mentioned heading to the showrooms with the plans, but mood boards, how do you kind of... Look, it's probably obvious to say it, but it's it's really a collaboration. I think from the trade customer perspective, he really wants to ensure that the product is going to be of a durable, suitable quality from mm. a performance point of view, that it's available to him. So when he goes to actually start the job, that the materials yeah. are on site. So I really encourage this kind of collaborative approach it's never too early to start the planning process around your bathroom and particularly if you're involved in a self-built project or a major renovation where you're going to be moving waste and pipes around often people come to these decisions kind of they start looking at the bathrooms kind of late in the day yeah. and maybe you know waste positions have already been determined and it doesn't necessarily suit the end result so getting in at a very early stage and thinking about what I call high level decisions when we get into product selection stage I would say from your say your trade typical trade, builder, plumber, installer. Don't be afraid to, to engage with us and, and leverage our expertise because to be fair to these guys, they can't be experts on every product in across all the different brands and suppliers That's that are job. out there. Our job is to be close to our product. So, you know, if, if they like what they see in terms of the product design, value for money, availability, and all those things that I feel we address, to get into some of the more nuanced conversations, we have the expertise, we have the resources, and we're a big support to Chadwick's and to the to the trade community. So actually send your customers to us or talk to us. We've got qualified technical people in our product design team and after sales team who would have worked on the tools installing bathrooms. So that whole kind of focus around the installer is absolutely central to what we're trying to do because we want happy customers at the end of it who has a bathroom that they can be proud of and enjoy and it's going to last them for a long time and have that longevity. So we just want to try and get it right for them. You mentioned sustainability earlier and I know, um, I don't think we've got quite here in this country, but I know in in Holland, for instance, they take um, I'm going to call it pre-love sanitary wear and, and they repurpose it back into uh, social housing and, and things like that uh, to stop those, you know, those baths and showers and toilets going into landfill. Do you see us moving in that direction in any way? I'm not sure. I do see there's a growing awareness around sustainability, but probably the big move we've made this year around repurposing products, at least, it's they're not pre-sold or pre-used but we would be quite a, quite a significant supporter for Habitat for Humanity. Okay. So yeah, again, yeah. any product Great that project, has yeah. has fallen out of kind of the current offering, it's we call it end of line, but absolutely perfectly good product. Uh, and it's difficult to sell that into your existing channels because everybody has an appetite for what's new and what's current. So we, we, we've we been donating quite a, a material sum of product uh, and they can use that product then to, to sell on. And delighted and, with and, it. And I'm delighted sure. with it yeah. and, and it yeah. goes towards their objectives as well. So we're tr- we're trying to do as much as we can around, as I said, the product development, operationally, you know, things like green energy, you know, reuse, recycling, and lots of different things around solar and all those kind of good initiatives for the business. Um, but there's a lot more to be done as well. I don't know from a an Irish psyche point of view whether we're, we're as well developed or will be uh, as our Dutch friends. But maybe in time, that yep. that's where it will go. Sure. So we we'll, we we'll watch this space. So Richard, that's been really interesting. Thanks so much for coming in and sharing uh, all the developments that are going on in the business. Um, Great to see you. Great to have you in here and uh, continued success to you. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Donika. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you.